They do. Okay, um, returning to First Thessalonians, uh, chapters one and two. Or, I mean, the First and Second Thessalonians. We'll be looking at uh, the entire books, but um, the First and Thessalonians, the Second Thessalonians, we know were uh, part of the first group of epistles that Paul wrote um, in his missionary journeys. In fact, we think that uh, this was written in his second missionary journey uh, from Corinth. Um, we know that he had a, re a really rocky problem, a rocky life in Thessalonica. They chased him out of there after they had already chased him out of uh, uh, Philippi. And yet he was there for just uh, maybe a, a six weeks to a couple of months. And yet we see a great body of work that... Uh, that uh, we find in Thessalonians, he was really able to disciple those people quite a bit. And really, this is the model church, uh, or at least the model uh, epistle, as far as uh, the church that is really growing and doing things for the Lord. And so really chapter one of First Thessalonians tells us so much about, about him. Uh, and let's just read Paul and Sylvanius um, and Timothy, uh, to the church of, Thessal of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to you, uh, to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing. Now here's the three keys. Whenever Paul talks to a church and he says, I remember these things, these are their strengths. If he leaves one out, that's their weakness, and he'll be talking about that. Or if he just if he doesn't come out directly about it, then that will be one of his emphasis, emphases. And so we see, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. And we said, faith works. Uh, it's not uh, that you, you're not working for salvation, but uh, uh, it's working after your salvation. But uh, faith works your labor of love, so we see that love works, it does something, and your patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, faith, hope, and love, these three. Remember what, uh, in First Corinthians, he says these are the things that remain, and these are the things that, uh, that we concentrate on. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election of God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, in much assurance, as you know what kind of man we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Archaea um, who believe. For from you, the word of the Lord sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, now that's the two sections of Greece. Uh, Macedonia was north, uh, was the no northern part of Greece. If you know, then this uh, little isthmus where Corinth is, and then you have the southern part. He says um, that uh, in Achaia, but in every place, your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do uh, not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how that we turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his, his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So we have in this... Uh, the, passage, just the real purpose and so forth as he sets forth his letter and also now you will notice in this passage and uh, or in this book, he's going to be first of all, he's going to be praising them for their salvation as we saw in chapter in chapter 1 and he's encouraging them they're the model church, uh, they're faithful, uh, they are they have the work of faith. I mean, they're doing something. And we'll see at the end of the chapter, he tells us what's happened in, within their lives. Um, we see the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. So that uh, the great thing about it, and this is what you like to see, and this is what uh, I'm sure is music to his ears. Whenever he heard anybody that came from Thessalonica, they said, my, 
that church is really doing something. That, that church is, those people are different. They're growing. I mean, that is, to a missionary or to anyone, that is just exactly what you want to hear. And that's what he's hearing. Remember, well, he says, you know, uh, from, for from you sounded out the word. In other words, you, people hear about you all over from all over Greece. They hear about you. And we don't need to say anything about you. We don't need to say, hey, listen, that church in Thessalonica, we start, no, this church was, was, was really going forward for the Lord and they were becoming um, self-contained and so forth. They didn't need a lot of outside help. And that's what we want to see. We call that an indigenous church. And that's what we are, we hope, is a, an indigenous church where we just depend on the Lord with no outside help. And we govern from within and so forth. And we solve our problems from within. Of course, we do have fellowship with other churches, like families have uh, fellowship with other churches. But uh, basically, we are a self-contained family of God, uh, as he calls it uh, in Ephesians, the, a, a temple of God. Both individually, we are temples. But as a church coming together, we're the temple of God. Not the, the, we're the people, not the building. And so... He is saying, uh, he is saying then, knowing beloved brethren, back in, um, let's see, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm going to be having problems the next couple of weeks until I get my new glasses. But remembering, verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in Christ Jesus. And so we see that they are evangelistic. They are going forward. But one of the main things, is that notice what, what is the sign, what are the signs of them growing together? Notice that he tells us in verse 9, for they themselves declare, in other words, those other people that have been telling us about what's going on in your, in, in your church, that uh, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had into you, and now that uh, you turn to God from idols. Remember, all these uh, Greek cities would have a major temple with a god usually up on a hill or whatever. And they would worship some god, whether Zeus or Jupiter or whatever, Diana. Uh, this, was, um, the, this was their trademark in their cities. And so we see that, um, that these people turned to God from idols. There was a definite lifestyle change. These idols controlled so much of the city. You had your banking, you had uh, your, uh, many of them would have their medicinal um, or the, their doctor's offices. Their, even sometimes their city clerks would be in the temple. I mean, it was just one um, a systemic um, worship of, of whatever God they were worshiping and they would bring their business and everything else into it. But you know, really as a Christian, isn't that the way that should be for us, whether we eat or drink or do business or whatever else we do all to the glory of God? So everything about our lives should be controlled by our king. Now, we don't have a temple to go to, and I do not want us to have a, a Calvary Baptist uh, National Bank downtown. You know, that would be nice, but no, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But uh I don't want any of that. Uh, I, I do believe in separation of church and state and really from society. I mean, I don't want, uh, I mean, I, I don't mind. Uh, I, I, we had a church where we, the people would come in um, and, and do the vote or whatever. They would have a polling booth. Churches have those type things. That's fine. But as far as getting in, intermingled within the town council and all that, I think we need to stay a little bit separate from that because then you really get into a lot of politics that uh, our main politic is to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ and watch God change their lives and watch what God does with them in their walks of life. And so um, we see that, and that's one reason that uh, I'm very concerned about many churches are going into business now. And, you know, you got all these pastors that... Uh, you don't know, I mean, they're into Amway and all the rest. Well, I've learned my lesson with that. I mean, you, it gets too involved. And you, it's one thing to deal with your people uh, business-wise, and it's another thing to deal with them uh, as a pastor. And you get all mixed up in that, and um, then you really start having problems. And um, that's why, like I ask you about how things are going at business, I tell you I'm praying for you. 
and I'm really rooting for you, and I want to go down there and whoop some people, but, you know, or whatever. But as a pastor, I stay out of your business, you know, because, um, but at the same time, when we do business, it's like, I, you know, with anybody, like if I go to a doctor or someone that, that I know as a pastor, that as a pastor, or if they come to church here, uh, then I say, hey, listen, now I am, I am different. I mean, uh, let's do business and don't think of me as you got to do it for me because I'm the pastor of the church or whatever. And so try to keep those separate. And yet, so, but he said, they turned to God from idols. So you can imagine what it was for these people. Now, all of a sudden they had problems with uh, the meat market. And Paul would talk to the Corinthians about that, about uh, whether you should eat meat offered to idols. Um, the banking system, the whole idea of going down to the temple and having your entertainment, because that's where all the entertainment, including the temple priestesses were, which were basically temple prostitutes. And so you had all the immorality. You could have a good old bar there to, for drinking. I mean, all kinds of things. And so for a person to get saved in Thessalonica, was to come out, I mean, was to really make a cultural change. And so no wonder they stuck out like sore, sore thumbs. They turned to God from idols, and everybody saw it. And shouldn't that be, as a Christian, uh, we have been blessed to live in a country that was, has been Christian-oriented, although uh, we see that it is turning away from the Lord now, and it's, we're becoming more and more the sore thumbs. But um, that's the that's the characteristic of Christianity throughout the ages has been that we're different. We're distinctive. We'll talk about that in the morning message. And so he says, he turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. So this is the key uh, of the Bible. Uh, we'll see uh, hundreds of times in the New Testament how that uh, we'll see from Matthew through Revelation, the mention of the Lord's return. And so we see that you, you're to wait to, for, your son, for uh, his son from heaven. And what did God say? Back in Acts chapter one, the same Jesus that went up into the clouds will also return. And so now we see that there's a problem and this is what he's going to address with the situation because he hasn't returned yet and some of these people are dying. And that's the big question that is going to be answered in First Thessalonians. And so he says, and to wait for the God from heaven whom he raised from the dead, uh, even the, uh, Jesus Christ, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now there's the next theological situation. What is the wrath to come? Now we know, because uh, and as he develops the doctrine, we know the next thing on God's calendar, big thing as far as that's concerned, um, is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like the big wedding day. I mean, you got a lot of other things to do, but you circle that day if you're a bride and you got a lot of, you got your hope chest, you got your wedding dress, you got everything ready, ready for it to come. And so, um, so he says, uh, first of all, we know that we are on our way to heaven, but what, comes af what, what happens when we leave this earth is the great tribulation, the, the hour of the Lord, as we have talked about earlier, the day of the Lord, which is the idea of day of judgment. And so the wrath to come then, excuse me, is that Christians are going to be taken up into heaven before the tribulation. Then we'll, uh, this is the doctrine now that is starting to be developed in First Thessalonians. Remember, we say that doctrine in the Bible is progressive. You start off in Genesis with the promise and the, and the picture of the Lord to come, and we see him coming in the, in the, in the book of Acts, and uh, then we see that, uh, how that uh, he went up into heaven and we see the church developed, and we see the prophecies uh, all into Revelation about his return. Well, First Thessalonians is one of the key chapters about his return, and so he's starting to develop that. 
in the book of Ephesians. He's going to develop the doctrine of the church, why we are here, and, uh, but we're looking for, forward to the heavenlies, and he'll use that term uh, many times in the book of Ephesians. But so we see, first of all, that we're waiting for the Lord to come, and as a result of that, we will flee from the wrath to come. And so he's going to be developing that uh, throughout the chapter, throughout First Thessalonians. And so he's writing to these people, and he's talking to them, and he's praising them for their faithful life and the power of the Spirit working in their life and their evangelistic uh, desires to see God work in other people's lives. But in chapter 2 now, he goes into the whole motive. He says, um, for yourselves now, brethren, that uh, our coming to you was not in vain, uh, even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi. And so he goes back and he goes through the book of Acts, chapter 16 and 17, about how that uh, they were chased out of Philippi, then they were chased out of Thessalonica, and right on down the coast of, of, uh, of um, Greece till he gets to Athens. And that's uh, where he has one of the greatest messages, but the least results. And when he gets to Corinth, he's pretty well broke. He's tired, he's been beaten half to death, and he's alone. He has left a lot of his uh, disciples or, or assistants behind in these various areas. And for the few, first few days, he's alone. And so that's when he was thinking back over the messages. And he realized, my, I really poured it, uh, you know, I really poured it into Athens about all the ph ph philosophies of man and so forth, and nothing happened. So then he writes later on to the uh, to the first Corinthians, to the Corinthians, and he says, I was determined when I got to you that I was just going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. We're going to, who cares about the philosophies? Because the natural man receives not the things of God. I mean, you could deal with people intellectually all you want to about the gospel, and you could rap about Jesus and all these different things that people like to do, but until the Spirit of God really deals in the heart of a person, and later on, as Paul says, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto the Lord. That is a spiritual transformation that only God can do. So we plant the seed and we ask God to empower it. And so we see that uh, now he is saying that uh, you know that we, have, we were spitefully treated and yet we spoke the gospel, but uh, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness nor from deceit. So you saw that we were genuine. And as a result, you were, you were saved, and God greatly has blessed your ministry now. And so as a model ministry, uh, we see that he talks about his conduct with, with them and um, the message that he has for them in verses 13 through 16, as he says, uh, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, uh, which you heard from us, uh, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. So he's looking back and he says, we really praise the Lord for how that you took our gospel and took our, uh, our, our preaching. And that's the thing. It's, uh, it's not that, uh, that you became, you did become followers of us, but the greatest thing from the preaching of the word is the fruit of what we see in changed lives. And this is what Paul is praising them for. And so he's saying, um, you are really growing in the Lord. And as a result of that, you have been able to even defend yourself against the, both Jews and Gentiles. And of course, he's going to talk about that in 2 Thessalonians because there's some problems with people that are coming in and corrupting the gospel. But uh, so he's telling us uh, there's the model, minist excuse me, the model ministry there. And what a great reward it is for him. In verse 17, he says, But uh, we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your faith, uh, your face with great desire. We want to see you. Um, therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, uh, time and again. But Satan hindered us. Um, but uh, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. And that is true of the ministry. Oh, we can build big buildings and you talk about great uh, 
empires that uh, that uh, some pastors can have or speakers or missionaries or whatever. But really, if you don't have the people, the buildings are going to rot and decay. We're here for the people. We're here to, and really, uh, I look back on my ministry and I've got a few tears that I cry for people that, that I saw, see falling away. But I really praise the Lord that I can look back with hope and joy and glory, uh, glory and joy at people that I know that God has used me in some way to work in their lives. I mean, it's a real thrill to, to, uh, to see that. And to have, uh, you know, of course, uh, been in three different states. And, um, and God has been very good. And so it's really good to see now kids and grandkids that are living for the Lord. And you, that's, that's the glory and joy. That's the only thing. I mean, the buildings are going to go. In fact, one of the buildings right now, I'm telling you, sell it and get rid of it, you know, get something better. Because, uh, I mean, I was talking to one of the men. I said, that building, we've gone from one end to another, and it was put together by committee. And it just, you know, just can't keep it going. And so they sell it and get, you know, those buildings... I, put, I poured my life into that building and I poured too much of my life into that building from one end to another. But the building is going to crumble. But who's around and what's happening in their lives and what's still happening in their lives, the only, the lives is the only thing that really counts. And so we see that, um, uh, that this is what Paul is writing to them about. And then he talks about that, you know, his deep concern for them because of the persecutions that they are going through. They who walk godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And you can imagine um, coming out of the temple, come, figuring out how to uh, not have to do anything with the parties that are going on at your work down at the temple. How not, how not to, have, uh, uh, to go down to see all your drinking buddies or to have the temple prostitutes and being on the retainer and all those different things that a, a man or a woman is coming out of. You can imagine those waitresses that would be the temple priestesses. If they got saved, would it change their lives? Big time. And so we see how the, this church is being formed by all this, these different walks of life. Um, and as a result, it was changing things. And people were saying that town is being turned upside down for the Lord. And so it would be a blessing to Paul, but it would also be a great uh, reason for persecution for those who resist. Um, I think of there's a guy named, there was a preacher, an old Texas preacher by the name of Sam Jones, not Bob Jones, but Sam Jones. And uh, this was back uh, in the turn of the uh, 20th century. And he was, he, would, he was a, a hellfire and brimstone preacher. And uh, this is back during the time of prohibition or when they were trying to get prohibition. And so one of the great cultural issues of the day was not abortion, but uh, but drinking or uh, alcohol. And um, when he came to town, the saloons uh, would try, they would be some of the biggest groups of people who would try to keep him out. And they would do all kinds of things to, uh, to him as far as trying to threaten him and threaten the crowds and so forth. But uh, what usually, what happened so many times was at least one or two of those bars would close up after he got through preaching because nobody was going there anymore because they got saved and so forth. Now, that was the great cultural issue of the day. Uh, well, I wish we could do that with abortion. I wish we could close down, a, a, not by, by government edict, but simply because we get enough people saved that nobody goes there anymore. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, that's, that's the cultural revolution I want to see. We're not going to get it done by edict. People are going to do what they want to do unless God changes their hearts. And so that's one of those personal things. That now, now I'm against abortion, definitely. You know I am. But uh, it's going to be, it's going to be it, it'll happen or people will quit having abor abortions when the conscience of the nation turns against it, not the laws. Because people are going to do it just like, they're, just like they did drinking. They're going to do it. And so, boy, that's a whole cultural issue, I know, right there. But you can imagine the cultural issues these people went through. How do you go down to your bank and, oh, uh, I mean, was that, did you have to walk by some of the bars and everything to get into the bank and the temple to, to get your business? What about the doctor? And he's down there. 
you know, or she's a whatever, you know. So all these, I mean, the, everything in your life was affected. Uh, there was well, I went to an old, uh, to a small, they called it a, uh, a small, a rural pastor's a preacher's conference. And it was, the guy came up with it because he says, you know, we go to all these big conferences downtown or whatever, or the big ministries, and they'll tell you how to run a church of 4,000 people, but they won't tell you how to run a church of 40, you know, or whatever. And uh, that was one of the best conferences I ever went to. And the message that I still remember was, it was entitled, Honey, You Would Never, it was, Honey, You Would Never Think, You Would Never Think of Who I Saw at Walmart. <laughs> I mean, in other words, when you are a pastor and people in your church in this small town, uh, you're going to see them in Walmart. You're going to go up and do your banking at the teller, and there they're going to be. And you hope you can smile up, but there are going to be people that are going to be leaving. <laughs> that, and that was so interesting because right after that, uh, my well, it was several years later, but um, when we were leaving um, Michigan, um, I think it was Daniel or Timothy was with me, and I went to Walmart, and there were four people that had given me trouble in my ministry there, and I met all four of them the last time I went to that Walmart. <laughs> the Lord has such a, an interesting sense of humor with me. He does crazy, I mean, I, he doesn't do crazy things, but to me they seem crazy. But uh, he just told me, okay, are you going to be sweet to them? Are you going to be nice? Are you not going to have bitterness and hold anything against them? And I treated them nicely, and they treated me nicely. Uh, even to this day, I would try to treat them nicely. Uh, I'm not sure I trust some of them anymore, but you know what I mean. But uh, there again, is you're going to meet those type people. And that's one of the sad things about a church in a smaller town is that you're going to run into those people. Now, Thessalonica was a big town, but it was still a town. And so, uh, and everything uh, would revolve around that temple. So, honey, guess who I saw at Walmart? You know, <laughs> guess who I saw? And so people are going to see you. They know that you go to that church. They know what you're supposed to be doing because what that, that church is so strict, you know, and boy, they'll be picking you apart. So you can imagine what it would be like to be in these towns that Paul was preaching in. Philippi was, no, was not a huge town. Corinth was a metropolitan town with a lot of coming and going, so it was a little bit different. But uh, most of these towns were, even if they were big, they were still kind of like farming communities. And like uh, I go in to have coffee with Al, and uh, and of course all these farmers around here, and they they were talking about, oh yeah, we went to school together back in 1947. I'm going, okay, <laughs> you know. So, and he'll have people from, and and, and now Al, of course, 95 years old, he forgets some of them, and they'll go, hey Al, how you doing? And they'll talk to you, and they'll talk, and he and I'll say, who are they? And they say, I don't know. <laughs> And so, so a lot more people know him than, than whatever. And so that's a lot of fun. But at the same time, it's a burden. Because, but the thing about Al, and praise the Lord for it, is everybody knows he's an honest businessman that comes to this church, you know? And so what a, what a blessing that is. 95 years old, he's still here on Sunday morning. He can't take, two, can't take my preaching for two hours, so he comes one morning in the morning and then one at night. What a, what a blessing that is. But what a testimony. And everybody knows what he's for and what he's against. <laughs> so, and, but that's, isn't that the way it should be as a Christian? They know our love, but they also know that we can't do certain things. Steadfast. Steadfast. Okay, good word. And so we see that uh, he's saying there is going to be faith. Uh, in your, there's going to be persecution because of your faith. But then the big, uh, the, the, the key, uh, the believers walk. Actually, in chapter 4, he begins with, Finally, brethren, we urge you and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that you abound more and more. So keep on growing. And he's going to say in verse 3, For this is the will of God, uh, or your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication or sexual immorality. So he comes out and says something that, oh my, we could, we could skate around this. No, it can't be any clearer in the Bible than this. That... God says that anything, any relationship outside of marriage is wrong. 
any physical relationship. And so that takes a, this, this is the will of God. And so that takes care of all the perversions out there, everything. It takes care of everything that went on that temple. And there was a lot of things that went on in the temples that are going on today. And he said, this is, this is the will of God. And so they knew it. And so he's just reiterating it. And so they were having to pull back and these guys that had uh, all these um, priestesses on retainer all of a sudden, and then they had their slave girls at home and all that kind of stuff, all of a sudden things are going to be changing culturally in a church. And all of a sudden a guy, love your wife, guys, and give yourself to her, one girl, you know. And so that was that was a... Was that a great cultural sh a shift from what they were doing? Definitely. It would be a great cultural shift in Washington, D.C. right now, wouldn't it? If everybody just went back to one, one, one man, one wife and faithfulness. We expect them to be unfaithful today. Look at, our, look at our candidates that are running, both male and female. They're all over the place. You think you have this real, oh, this woman, she's going to be nice. She's, uh, she, you know, she's all, and all of a sudden you find out she's got so many skeletons in the closet. And same way with the guy. Of course, the guys we don't even have to talk about because it's been like that for years. And the exception is the surprise. I mean, because it's very rare that you find people that don't do that. And uh, that's, our, that's our politics. But, the real, but if we're a government by the people, what does that tell us about the people? They're doing the same thing. And so that's our cultural shift uh, that we need to see in this country. But then, okay, very quickly, we see that the big and the key, one of the key passage here as far as eschatology, the doctrine of the last things, is verses 13 through the, uh, the rest of the chapter. He says, but, uh, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Euphemism passed away. Euphemism died you know, that uh, have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow like others who have no hope. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Christ Jesus. So that tells us that those who are have dead, that, that we are going to see them again. When, it, when will we see them? When he comes. Now, we're going to be, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to earth then, or when he comes, excuse me, to in the rapture, uh, if we're dead, we're going to be behind him coming down. If we're alive, we're going to be going up to meet him in the air. Here, there, or in the air, as people like to say. Uh, I want to be the rapture generation. I would love, Lord, just come today, because I would be one of those people, and you would too, if you know the Lord, um, you would be those people that had never died physically in heaven. Wouldn't that be great? We'd be the rapture generation. Gener generation R, I guess, or whatever they want to call it. Wouldn't that be great? But, uh, and so, but at the same time, I, I have the assurance that one way or the other, I'm going to be with the Lord. And so, and I'm going to be meeting a lot of people in the air, just like you will. And because he says, for this I say to you, by the word of the Lord, remember the word of the Lord is, you can bank on it, that uh, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are who have dead, but the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first bodily. So there's gonna be a lot of people coming out of graveyards then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So we see that he's answering the big question that these um, Thessalonians are having. Was, hey, listen, uh, you know, some of our people have died. Where are they? Because how, did they miss going to heaven? No, he said, no, they're there. In fact, later on, he'll talk to the Corinthians and he'll say, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So he notice he keeps developing this as he writes to each uh, to these different churches, but he doesn't give it to them all nine yards at once. But it, as you read that through and you start developing the revelation that he's giving us about life, death, rapture, 
things to come. And so we see that um, then it has the key passage. There's the other key passage, and that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and that's the resurrection chapter. And at the end of the resurrection chapter, he talks about our resurrection, chapters 50, verses 51 through 58, about how, again, that uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. And so, um, and of course, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the Lord, so, so, that's, so those are the two key passages that we get where we call it the rapture. And so uh, the perusia, the, the calling away. And so uh, that's the key passage. And then in, cha in verses in chapter five then, he's gonna go into the believer's conduct again. And uh, this is one of those great passages where he, um, he just starts issuing commands. Um, pray without ceasing. Uh, uh, let's see, in all things give thanks. You know, and so he just, um, he gives them, um, well, let's see. We exhort you, brethren, verse 13, uh, 14. Um, warn those who are unruly and so forth. But he says in verse 16, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy. Test all things. So notice he just goes through, uh, and he's talking to these people very quickly. It's a short letter, and he's not going to uh, develop everything at once. But he says, this is what I want you to do. But um, that's that great passage, in all things give thanks. Not for all things, but in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And so we see that, uh, in, uh, that uh, this uh, book is laid out for us. So it's just simple Christianity, that uh, if you're saved, you're changed. And if you're changed, the world's going to see it. And, um, and, you, and your hope is in the Lord. The great contrast is between you who have hope, faith, hope, and as compared to those who have no hope. So notice they have hope, but he's reinforcing that hope. Hey, listen, don't worry about it. Uh, you, we don't know exactly what's going to go on, but we do know the Lord's going to come back for you, and you're going to meet, and he answers the question, what's going to happen to my grandma that passed away knowing the Lord? Isn't that a great? So he, he answers that for us. Now, while you're down here, you got to deal with the nasty now and now. You got to deal with all those people at Walmart or whatever, you know. But, uh, uh, but there again, you've turned to God from idols, and so and you're serving the living and true God. Now, in chapter, and very quickly, we'll have to just uh, the the key thing to the Second Thessalonians is that now people are coming in, and they are saying, "Oh, the Lord's already come." And the devil always comes in and tries to confuse the believer. Uh, they're saying, well, listen, Nero's been killing a lot of people and he was the Antichrist or whatever. Well, no. Uh, and so, and he tells us in chapter two and the, uh, the key passage here to just, re, um, to, in a nutshell, uh, chapter two of um, First Thessalonians, or Second Thessalonians, he says, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together with him, we ask uh, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by letter. There's a lot of people writing all these letters, and Paul saying, I didn't write them. Uh, Let no one deceive you, in verse 3, by any means, for the day of the Lord, that day will not come unless there's a great falling away first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and what is worshiped so that he sits as God. Now, who are we talking about there? Remember Paul or John said, uh, he called him the Antichrist and, John, and Paul calls him the man of sin. But he's not gonna be revealed until when? After the rapture. And so that so he's going to explain that to them, and everything around First Second Thessalonians now is going to be a reinforcement of First Thessalonians of living right for the Lord. And so these two uh, books, these two letters, one was to solve their fears about what happens after if someone dies or if you die, and secondly, uh, to tell, hey, listen, there's a lot of letters out there, there's a lot of phoniness, but stick with the word the word of God. And boy, you know, 
And again, we'll be talking about those who truly believe the Lord. If we have these, pro and prophecy's a dime a dozen today. I mean, you, people are building and making a lot of money off of prophecy. And if you get a few facts together and so forth, you can raise a crowd. But uh, the Bible says, and we'll look at that this morning, if we have this hope in us that the Lord's coming, we will purify ourselves even as he is pure. And there's a lot of people out there who said, oh, listen, I want to know about Israel, and I want to know about Gog and Magog, and I want to know about the kings of the east and all that. But, uh, oh, you mean I'm going to quit my ways of, wait a minute. Uh, I don't want that. I just, just tell me about prophecy. That's what I want. But if we have that hope in us, we will turn to God from idols. Amen? And so that's a, really in the nutshell uh, the uh, first and second Thessalonians, we'll see this over and over again, talking about prophecy, is living right uh, and being right when we see the Lord Jesus Christ, either by death or by rapture. Okay, any questions before we uh, close tonight, today? We've got a couple of minutes. Okay, then we'll close in prayer. Okay. Lord, now we pray that we will be distinctive, that others will see that we walk with you. We realize, Lord, we're imperfect, and the world's expecting something from us, and many times we can't deliver because we're not perfect. But at the same time, Lord, may they see that we seek your face, that we want your will, that we love them because you love them, and we want them to have what we have. So, Lord, we pray that we will have inroads into the structure, into the very culture and the fabric of Belvedere like they had in Thessalonica. May people turn to God from their idols to serve the living and true God. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.